All right, so any questions? Everybody here is presented already, right? For PA5? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, everybody ready for their presentations this afternoon? I've been thinking it was Friday. <laughs> So, um, so 3 o'clock Digital Lounge, I might be there a couple of minutes late, but your sign-in sheet will be either taped to that front desk um, at the main office, or there'll be a table there, and it'll be taped onto that. But there'll be something obvious. There'll be a sign-in sheet. There'll be a stack of posters. There'll be a stack of yellow signature sheets. All right. so find your poster, grab a signature sheet, make sure you sign in on the list for 224. Um, find a table or come in here, take a table out. And, um, and have fun. So um, one reason we do the presentations is, you know, because this is a large scale project, it's something you work on for three quarters at least. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of a, a major milestone along the way to the June uh, completion. Um, but it's a chance to kind of showcase what you've been doing right, to sort of show off, to take the work that you've been putting in and, and be able to talk about it and so on. Um, it's also a chance for other people who are not doing service learning projects or who are in different classes and so on, or even, you know, other classmates, to see what you've been up to, right, to get an idea of what kinds of things are going on. So my 101 class students from that often come to these presentations and they'll be doing this themselves in a year or two, but it gives them an idea of kind of where they're heading what sorts of stuff can be done and it's like, you know, maybe they've never thought about using a Raspberry Pi to make music and maybe that's somebody's project and they see that and it's like, you can do that? So it's, it's you know, kind of a, a inspirational sort of thing. The other reason why I think the SLPs are really good, particularly the presentations, is because they can really help you in refining your project in your own head. Right, so you may think you have a pretty clear idea of what it is that you're doing, but it's really when you try to explain it to somebody else that you figure out, do I understand it? Are there things I haven't thought about? Right, or is this like way cooler than I actually realized because I just got sick of it over the past 10 weeks, right? But it's actually a really cool project. So being able to like answer questions about it, being able to explain it to somebody else is a really good part of the process of going through this project. Um, it can many times help you sort of pin down exactly what it is you're doing or what is it that's unique about this thing that I'm trying to do or how does this differ from something else. Um, those kinds of, of questions and answers can be pretty profound. So it's not uncommon that during the two hours of presentation you may come out the other side with a slightly different or maybe a very different perspective on your project. Right? You may be much more excited about it afterwards than you were before. You may have some new insight to, oh, you know, I could take it in this direction instead of that direction and so on. So, um, so it, can be, it can be beneficial to you as well. So my suggestion is try to have fun with it. Right? It's very, very low key. So there's no pressure. Right? You're not graded on the style of your presentation or how well you answer questions or anything like that. You're graded basically for showing up and participating. So you can relax and enjoy, you know, talking about your project to people, explaining things, um, and, you know, walking around looking at other people's projects, getting some signatures, get some extra credit. Um, but it's, it's pretty chill and it can, be, it can be kind of fun. So hopefully you have a good time with it and, and I'll be there and I always enjoy kind of seeing what people have been doing. Um, and again, it's the first of three quarters, right? So your goal here is really kind of like, pinning down what it is you want to work on. In the June Expo, which is, you know, at the end of the third quarter, that's where people tend to have sort of finished products or, you know, as finished as they got. And it's really cool to kind of look back sometimes and sort of see where people started and then see where they get to at the end of, of you know, 40-some weeks of work. And it can be pretty stunning. So, um, so enjoy the process. All right, so I want to I talk just a little bit more about this business of signals and processes, and then I'm going to start on some 222 stuff. Um, but I just wanted to mention a few more things in here. So this was the signal code we were playing with yesterday. Um, 
So we're using the call to signal to set up a handler, right? So here I'm setting up a handler for sig user one, and my main program is just going to sit here in a loop and just say waiting and keep printing out successive integers. And my handler, if it gets a sig user one, it'll say ping pong, otherwise it'll just tell me it got a signal and it'll return. So there's our main program running. Um, and if I do a PS, I can see that this is process 19406. So I can say kill sig user 1, um, 19406. Right, and so my process got this signal, it did its ping pong, and then it goes back to where it was. And it continued exactly where it left off. It had printed out waiting 15, got the signal, now it's waiting 16, 17. Okay, so very much a software version of an interrupt. Now, I can also trap a sig int. It's a different kind of signal. So now if I kill with a sig user 19418, it says I got user defined signal one and the process terminates. But if I kill with a sig int, uh, so where are we, 19423, right? It tells me I got signal two, which is what sig int is, but it trapped it, right? So it didn't interrupt the process and then it just continues running. Here's the cool thing. If I hit Control C, it doesn't terminate my program anymore. It says I got signal two, and it continues where it left off. Why does this happen? Because Control C does not terminate a process. Control C sends a signal. In particular, it sends a signal sig int. And the default behavior when a process gets a sig int is to terminate. But we've changed that behavior in this program by saying, if you catch sig int, I want you to call this program handler. And handler says, I got a signal, tells me what the signal is. All right, and then it goes back to where it was. But we can always kill with kill signal nine. That's a sig kill. And that's untrappable. But, you know, we can do the obvious. All right, so. Can't spell either. But. <laughs> Nineteen four fifty seven. All right, so that kills it. So if we set this up for sig kill, all right, tells me can't set up signal handler. Why? Because sig kill is by definition not trappable. Well, not by definition, but by arrangement. All right, so down here it tells me sig kill and sig stop cannot be caught or ignored. <coughs> But all these other signals are available <coughs> for responding to however we want. So sig int signal 2, that's what you get when you hit a control C. Sig hup signal 1, um, hup is hang up. So long ago we had acoustic couplers and phones. And when you wanted to talk to a computer, you dialed up the phone number of the computer, 
and you would take your phone, you'd put it in this thing called an acoustic coupler, and it would make beep sounds, and those beeps carried the ones and zeros. When you were done talking to the system and you wanted to terminate this conversation, you would take the phone and you'd hang it up, right? Um, and so signal one, sig hub, basically does the same thing. It's used for, for closing down a communication. Um, sig quit, um, sig term, all these other things, different versions of, of closing a process. Um, SIG power is presumably something that's used when the power starts to go out on a system, right? This is, this is a pretty common scenario. You have a computer and it's running and there's a, something that's monitoring the power line so that if something happens, if there's a power failure or if someone trips on the cord and it comes out of the wall, the power doesn't immediately go to zero, right? It takes a little while for it to, to trickle down to a voltage where the system is no longer viable. But you have a circuit that detects that drop in the voltage and can generate a signal, SIG power, which says, hey, the power is failing, what should we do, right? How long do you have between the time you pull a plug and the time that the computer crashes? Not a lot of time, but a lot of time, right? It might be milliseconds, but if you're doing a billion things a second, that's a lot of time. It's enough time to do something like perhaps turn on a backup power supply, right? Or take the contents of some critical section of memory and write it off to disk. Or move the disk heads into some known configuration so your disk doesn't crash. Or something, right? So a SIG power would be sent to processes and they would have the option of responding to this, this uh, power condition. Um, SIG alarm is probably used when some kind of timer condition expires. Right, because if you want something to happen in 25 seconds, you don't want to keep checking the clock saying, has it been 25 seconds, has it been 25 seconds? You want to say, let me know when 25 seconds have passed. So you set something up in a range that after that amount of time, a SIG timer signal is sent to you, a SIG alarm, and now you can go off, you can do whatever you want, and after that time passes, you get this signal, you come down to your handler code, and you know that, you know, 25 seconds has passed. Does that remind you of anything from 270? <laughs> All right, that's how the timers work. All right, so we still have access to that in, in a Unix system. And this whole thing is basically like interrupts. So SIG FPE is interesting. So that's signal 8. FPE is floating point exception. So let's try something. So I'm going to do i equals 5 divided by i. And you'll notice i is an integer and I initialize it to 0. So this is going to set i equal to 5 divided by 0. And we know that's probably not a good thing to do. But we're going to do it anyway. And we get this message that says floating point exception. Well, how did that message get printed? Because there's nothing in here that said if denominator equals zero, print floating point exception. And if you look at the assembly language for this, there's nothing that says before you divide, check the denominator and see if it's zero. Because that would be really inefficient. So this is handled through basically an interrupt. So when you divide by something, you use a divide instruction. There's some piece of your hardware called a floating point unit that's doing, you know, the shift and subtract kind of division we do with pencil and paper or something equivalent. And that hardware, which is a state machine, has circuitry that detects when that denominator is zero. And what does it do if it finds a zero on the bottom? It sends a signal. And the signal will be SIG FPE, floating point exception. And by default, when a process gets a SIG FPE, it prints out floating point exception. It does what we call dumping the core, which doesn't really happen anymore. Um, and then it, it terminates the process. So 
we can set up a handler for a SIG FPE. And we can print out a message saying, hi, you tried to divide by zero. this, you have a bunch of messages saying you tried to divide by zero. So sometimes when you get an exception, the system will continue with the following instruction. Sometimes when you get an exception, it will go back and it will retry the instruction. It depends on what caused the exception. In the case of a division, if we divide by zero or we get some kind of floating point exception, it will throw the signal. If we come back from the handler, it will retry that instruction. So if I was a global, we could increment it by one or we could set a flag and, and deal with it like that. Right? But the, the punchline here is that we're trapping this floating point exception handler, right? And this is useful to think about because what's going on here? Um, this won't happen if you run this code on an Arduino processor, right? Or if you compile this onto a PIC processor, right? There's three things in play here. There's this user program, the C program that we've written, which is executing instructions. It's compiled into assembly language, right? And it's, it's doing its thing. Um, but there's also an operating system underneath, and there's also hardware. And all three of those things are interacting with each other. And sometimes that's important to know, right? So we're programmers, we write C code, but that doesn't mean we can completely ignore the hardware, the operating system, the fact that there's, there's signals being sent and so on and so forth, because they all sort of tie into each other. And that's, that's a nice sweet spot where these things come together. All right, so there's the assembly language version of my program that just sets i equal to zero over zero. And Here's where one zero is being loaded into a register, and here's where the next zero is being loaded into a register, and here's the integer divide instruction. And again, nothing in there that says, you know, print out floating point exception if, if the denominator is zero. The hardware sees the denominator, sends a signal, and the process responds to it. And that's really, really good because it means we don't have to check for that ourselves. Right? This is what happens with memory when you try to access memory location zero. We don't need to write code that says, you know, if this address is zero, then print out segmentation <coughs> fault. It happens automatically. How? Through a signal <coughs> mechanism. So one of these signals presumably is generated when you access something that's out of bounds. And it's a signal being generated by the memory unit. And this, this card dump business that it says, um, it used to be when you got errors like that, you would end up with a file called core. And it would be basically a copy of your memory. So that after the fact, you could go in with GDB and you could say, okay, use this file as a map of what was in memory when the error occurred. And you could see your situation right before the error. And you could actually figure out where things were going wrong, what was in what variable, and so on and so forth. And that doesn't happen automatically anymore. I actually don't know if it's possible to turn it on or not. Um, but core dump was basically a dump of the memory. And if you want to know why it's called core, check out that little exhibit down at the end of the hallway. There's a core memory in there in the corner. And core dump means the core memory.
All right, so questions, comments on any of this? Again, you're not you're not responsible for all these details, right? I just want you to know the very basics of like the fork command for, for the fork function for making a clone, um, the process ID it returns, um, general process concepts, the PS command and so on. But all of this stuff is extra. Um, Everything from here on out is totally not on the final exam, okay? Because I want to start doing a bit of a preview of some 222 topics. And so I want to look at structures and pointers and addresses and memory allocation and things like that. Um, and that's, that's not on your final. So um, Thursday and Friday I'm earmarking for review. Okay, but obviously if you have questions at any time you can ask them, but um, study guide has been posted on Canvas for a few days already, um, but we can just sort of go through that Thursday and Friday and talk about whatever. Um, but I want to do some preview of where we're going in winter, just to kind of get things moving in that direction. Um, so in our, our dictionary program, PA4, I kept talking about parallel arrays, right? And the idea was um, we had something like this. We had two structures. We had a two-dimensional array of characters, which is also a one-dimensional array of strings. Right? And then we had a one-dimensional array of integers, and the idea was count bracket i is the number of times dictionary bracket i appears. All right, so it's two structures, and we keep them in parallel, two arrays, and the ith element in one corresponds to the ith element in the other. And that works fine, okay? But imagine that you have several pieces of information associated with this. Um, maybe you want to know the location where this first appeared. So you have an array of loc, um, so integer location 1000. And this is where dictionary I first appears. This is number of occurrences. This is your phrase. And so on, right? So you can start having a large number of things that you're trying to keep in sync and every time that you do a sort and you want to swap two phrases, you need to swap the corresponding counts and the corresponding locations and so on. So the way we deal with that in C is we use a structure. We can say structure, whatever we want to call it. Um, structure phrase. And then inside curly brackets, we can list all the different pieces of this structure. So we might have uh, car, uh, the phrase 120, integer count, that's the number of times the phrase occurred, integer location, that's the location and the input where it first appeared. I was pretty sure in C you couldn't uh, define uh, an array with just putting like 120 on that chart. So whenever I learned worked in C, it wouldn't have let me define a structure. Well, let's find out. I had to make it a char pointer and then set the length of the pointer using the malloc. That would be a drag, wouldn't it? It works in C++, but it wasn't working in C. I use the array and structure for the programming assignment. Yeah, and it worked?
So um, there are cases where it's not going to like that 120. It was, I did have like a struct and then it had a struct inside a struct and there were arrays inside this. Okay. Like inside the struct. Yeah, so there, there definitely are cases where I won't like it, but I'm having trouble drumming up what the distinction might be at this moment, but it always bites me when it does come up. I always um, had to make it a pointer and then yeah. malloc and look for the pointer. Okay. The initial is the variable and the main. So I'm thinking if it's somehow inside something else that's dynamic, then it might force you to do that. <coughs> but a simple case like this, it should work. <coughs> But yeah, next time you find that, show it to me. Yeah, it was on the chemical computer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a simple code, right? Um, all right, so here, here's a structure called phrase. And effectively, what we're doing is we're creating a new type of variable. Right? So we've got integers, we've got characters, we've got doubles. We're basically creating a new type of character called a structure phrase. And so this is a declaration of the structure. And when I want to declare a variable of this type, I can say struct phrase variable name. Right? And it's just like saying integer p or character p, except I'm saying struct phrase p, and so p is a phrase. So this phrase has different pieces to it. It's got the phrase, it's got count, it's got location, and so on. When you want to access one of those, you just use a period. So you can say p dot location equals five. Right, and that's setting this piece of this composite structure to a five. I can say p dot count equals zero. That sets the count to be a zero. And it looks just like an integer. Anything I can do with an integer, I can do with p.count. I can print it with a percent %d. I can set something equal to it, and so on and so forth. Now, p dot the phrase looks exactly like a car bracket 120. Anything I can do with a car bracket 120, I can do with p dot the phrase. So I could say, you know, integer i equals string length of p dot the phrase, and that's going to be perfectly valid. Because this is just a string, a car 120. So at this level, this is just a convenience. It's a way of, instead of having um, an array of locations, an array of counts, an array of strings, right, we can bundle those together and use a single symbol, p, entry, this phrase, whatever, to represent all three of these pieces. And if we want to pass this dictionary entry to a function, we don't have to pass the string, the number of occurrences, and all this other information. We just pass this one variable p, and all these pieces come along with it. Right? So it's largely a convenience at this point. Um, but we can also do things like this. And this declares an array named dictionary, and it's an array of a thousand phrases. So now if we want to see what our first phrase is, it's just this. Dictionary bracket zero dot dot the phrase. And if we want to know how many times that occurred in our input, 
It's just this. And it's still largely just a convenience, but it's getting to be more than that. And so I could write a function, print phrase, that takes a struct phrase as an argument. That's a scribble. And maybe what this print phrase routine does is it prints out a single phrase. It prints out the uh, angle bracket followed by the number of times that phrase occurs as a five digit number with zeros in the beginning and then a closing angle bracket and then it prints out the actual phrase. All right. And then my main program when it wants to print out the entire dictionary is just a simple for loop for i equals zero, i less than the number of entries, i plus plus, print phrase, parentheses, dictionary bracket i. Right. And I pass all of this stuff Right, by just passing in one of these phrases. So it's, it's really about bundling things together. And in this case, we're bundling different pieces of data and calling them one thing, for example, P if P is a phrase, or dictionary bracket I if dictionary is an array of phrases. And we're going to do this a lot in 2.22 because we're going to be dealing with what are called data structures which are, so an array is a data structure. It's a way to organize data. But most data structures are more than just an array. They're different collections of, of different types of data. For example, an array of uh, characters and a pair of integers, right? And so we want to bundle those together into something we call a phrase. In Spring, when we go into object-oriented programming, it's the same type of extension but in addition to bundling together pieces of data, we're just going to bundle in pieces of code as well. And so we're going to have these kind of like superstructures that contain pieces of data that logically go together, but also contain pieces of functions that logically make sense to go together with these data items. And that's going to give us something we call an object. And that's, that's the whole gig of object-oriented programming is, is seeing the world as these objects. So 222 winter, we go partially down that path, but really we're bundling pieces of data together, and we're calling them structures in C. So let's, let's pass this to a function. So our main program will set up these different fields of the structure, right? So, so you define a structure, we can call these things fields. So the phrase count and location. So we'll set those up just saying structure variable name dot and then the field. And then we're just going to pass that to a function. We're just going to pass this one variable, which is p, which is this composite structure. 
And in our function, we tell it the argument it's getting is a structure phrase, which means in here, we can use argument dot any of these fields, length, count, and the phrase, and it should have whatever values we loaded into it up here. Are you missing a comma? Uh, where? Uh, yes. Thank you. All right, so. So, no big surprises here, right? So we pass that, tell that's the location count and phrase. So in our main program, let's print out the pieces of this structure P. Let's print out its, its location count and phrase. Right, and no surprise, right? Because main's where we created this. But let's try the following. So let's change the fields inside this phrase P argument down here. Let's set the location and count equal to zero. Let's change the phrase to ha ha. And what is going to happen? What, what, what are we pretty sure is going to print down here? Zero, zero. Yeah, zero, zero and ha ha. What about up here when we get back to our main function? Right, so this is the question, is it going to print zero, zero, ha, ha, or is it going to print five, twelve, hello? Yes, it depends on whether or not this function can modify that argument. And guess what, it can't. Right, this is no different from what we've tried to do before. Right, set an integer to five, pass it to a function, print out the value. And in our function, we say set the argument to zero and return. And we know that this does not actually change the value of i. Right, why? Pass by value. So in this case, when we call function i, it really says function 5. And down here, x is equal to 5. Here we set x equal to 0. We return. Right? We haven't done anything with i. Exactly the same thing even if this argument happens to be a structure. It's passing the value of it. It makes a copy of it. Right? And that's what this function is, is operating on. So how do we deal with this in the old case? We pass the address of i. And in our function, we say that x is a pointer to an integer. 
And then we say the thing pointed to by the argument should be set equal to zero. That works. So we use the pass by value mechanism to effectively pass by reference or pass by address. Well, we can do the same thing over here. So we can pass the address of our structure. And then down here, we have to say what we're receiving is a pointer to a struct phrase. And then we can say the thing pointed to by arg.log pointed to by arg.count and pointed to by arg.thephrase. And I normally go crazy with parentheses, but I'll be brave. Let's see what happens if we don't put in parentheses. Ha! <laughs> uh, we got to do it here too, though. because of the prototype. Yes, I think I need some parentheses. So the thing pointed to by arg is a struct phrase, and I'm after these fields in that struct phrase. These are good, I guess. So if we run this, right, when we get back into our main program, inside pane, inside main, <laughs> these location count and phase have been updated by the function. So we end up doing this a lot because these structures are going to be key to developing these things that we're calling data structures. And we're going to want to pass them around a lot. So when we say struct phrase star arg, we're saying arg is a pointer to that structure. And when we want to access, say, the location field, we say the thing pointed to by arg, which is a structure, give me the location field. And that's really clunky to write because we've got parentheses and we've got stars. And it's going to get really clunky pretty fast because we're not just going to have integers and characters inside our structures. We're going to have other structures inside our structures. So there's a shorthand for this, which is arg arrow field name. And this means that arg arrow loc means parentheses star arg close paren dot loc. But the way we sort of think of this in our heads is arg is a pointer. Find the thing it points to. Give me the location field. And so we can do better over here. And write this. So arg arrow loc, arg arrow count, arg arrow the phrase.
should be commas. Yeah, it should be commas. Thank you. All right, so exactly the same thing. It's just an alternative syntax in C, but it compiles down to exactly the same stuff. And we'll do this all the time in 222. And here's the reason. Right, we're going to have integers and characters and things like that in there. We might actually have a pointer in here called S, which is a pointer to a struct stuff. And S, uh, struct stuff, might have a field called ha. And so P is a struct phrase. pointer. And suppose we want to take the thing that P points to and we want to find the S field and find the thing that that points to and pull off the HA field. So if we do this with parentheses, we have to say parentheses star P, take the S field, take the thing that that points to and give me the HA field. All right, now we're writing Lisp code. If we use the arrow notation, we can say P arrow S. Well, that's a pointer to struct stuff. Take the thing that that points to, give me the ha field. And this will just make you smile. Because what we're actually going to be doing with these things will actually feel like something pointing to something pointing to something. So it's just syntax, right? This is exactly the same as that, but this is going to turn out to be a lot better because the structures we're going to be dealing with are going to be structures that contain other structures. All right, so tomorrow, bring questions if you have them, but tomorrow we're going to jump into GDB and we're going to look at these structures inside um, the debugger and see sort of how they're laid out in memory, and we'll play around with that. All right, so I'll see you tomorrow.